Ambassador Ischinger, greetings. Great to see you on First Western. It's a big honor to have you in our program. It's a pleasure to be on your program. I would like to start with the upcoming Munich Security Conference, which will take place in February uh, next year. Uh, will, be, will the war in Ukraine be main topic for discussions and uh, will this conference be a special one? Well, of course, um, uh, remember uh, when we had the Munich Security Conference uh, a year and a half ago, um, President Zelensky attended and uh, like three days, three or four days after the conference, uh, the Russians started the war. So, of course, the Munich Security Conference regards it at, at an, as an obligation to keep the item of the Russian war of aggression against Ukraine on the agenda. And of course, we will uh, make a, a big effort to, um, to demonstrate um, our intention uh, to bring this war to a successful conclusion for Ukraine, uh, hopefully by the time of the next conference. And if the war has not yet ended by next February, we will try to make a make make a, a, a good effort to demonstrate the West's resolve, American resolve, European resolve to help Ukraine uh, to continue to uh, to uh, reacquire, to liberate the territories currently occupied by the Russian invaders. Uh, will President Zelensky also be invited to join next conference? Oh, of course. Certainly uh, uh, want to invite President Zelensky. We will certainly invite um, uh, uh, Foreign Minister Kuleva and um, uh, Defense Minister uh, Reznikov, uh, as well as other senior members of the Ukrainian leadership, including my friend Andrei Yarmak and, and, and others. Of course, absolutely. Also, I would like to cover with you Western policy towards the war in Ukraine. How could you assess Western strategy, current Western strategy towards the war in our country? Well, let me tell you what I think. Uh, we believe uh, that, of course, at the end of this war, will need to be a serious negotiating activity to come to not only, you know, a, a, a hopefully a permanent ceasefire or even some kind of ar arrangement for peace. But in order, in order to uh, to get the Russian side to um, start negotiating with Ukraine seriously, I believe that the Russian side needs to understand that the continued application of military force in Ukraine against Ukraine is not going to produce any additional meaningful results for the Russian side. Now, my, my concern is that at this moment, as we speak, uh, this awareness has not yet been created sufficiently in Moscow, which is why our Western strategy should be to continue to support the Ukrainian war effort, hopefully with the aim of, uh, of making Russia understand that continuing this war is not going to lead to a good result for Russia. That's the, the basis for meaningful negotiations from my point of view. We will cover also negotiations, but US media reports that Russian minefields and Russian defense lines are slowing down uh, Ukraine's efforts to liberate all 
territories. Uh, in, your, in your opinion, is there a need to increase military support for Ukraine? I guess, indeed, I believe that um, uh, given the defensive arrangements um, which Russia has built uh, in Donbass in, 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 and in the southeast of Ukraine, um, we need to, re to, to review our possibilities to deliver uh, not only more, but maybe even more effective uh, weapons uh, to the Ukrainian armed forces so that they can uh, hopefully undertake a more successful and more rapid um, uh, drive to liberate these territories which have been so extensively mined, etc. I think that it is uh, important in this connection to have for the future the option of additional Western aircraft. Uh, you are aware, of course, of the ongoing discussion about delivery of F-16 aircraft by European countries. It is a good sign, a good signal that uh, the United States has now declared, because they, they produce these airplanes, that they will accelerate the process of, of uh, permission uh, for these aircraft to be actually offered to Ukraine, hopefully sooner rather than later. They could, they could make an important contribution to the Ukrainian effort to liberate, uh, in, especially also the areas that have been so extensively covered with Russian mines. Also, there is a public debate in Germany on Taurus long-range cruise missiles. Do you personally support providing Ukraine with Taurus missiles? As far as I am concerned, um, I believe that the delivery of these weapons could, um, will not be a game changer, but could, be, uh, could give additional help, could be an additional help for for Ukraine. So in principle, I am in favor, but I understand that Chancellor Schultz uh, wants to make 100% uh, uh, clear that he is in line with the United States and with other NATO allies in how to uh, schedule and, and how to structure um, our, deli our deliveries to uh, Ukraine. I hope, I hope very much that an early decision um, on this type of, um, of cruise missiles uh, will actually be taken by the German government, hopefully in coming days and not in coming months. Do you believe that this public discussion in Germany will lead and will push Chancellor Scholz to agree to provide us with Taurus missiles? Well, I think, you know, it, uh, it's important to have a responsible uh, discussion. There are a number of questions that need to be examined um, within our government. The question is, how many of these missiles could we conceivably give to Ukraine? How many do we need? under NATO rules uh, to, to have for our own uh, air force. Uh, in other words, um, what is the number of, of these delivery systems that we could conceivably give away? That's the first question. Second question is, um, uh, what, about, uh, what about NATO allies? Are, are they all in agreement that we do this? Um, is the United States, which has not so far offered to Ukraine these types of longer range weapons, is the United States of the view that this is a good idea or rather not. These discussions have, been, have started. There will be a positive outcome in the near future. Also, Spiegel reports that Chancellor Scholz could agree to provide such missiles 
if there are, they are, are modified and if they are made impossible to strike on Russian soil, uh, do you think that it is a good idea to limit Ukraine's capabilities in the middle of war? Well, I think you need to, you need to distinguish two issues, two questions. The first question is, is Ukraine entitled to uh, attack Russian military installations in Russia? Uh, my view would be, of course. Um, this war does not need to be seen as an asymmetric war, which can only be conducted on Ukrainian soil. That would be an extremely unfair view of the um, situation in, in this conflict, in this war. Um, the second question, which is very different from the first question, uh, is, um, is, it, uh, uh, is it in the interest of NATO allies to make sure that we uh, do not um, start a process that could lead to a direct confrontation between the Russian Federation and NATO or NATO partners. This is what the United States, Germany, and others have uh, <coughs> had discussions with your government, with the Ukraine government, to make sure that uh, the, the systems which we deliver, which we have delivered to Ukraine, are going to be used uh, on Ukrainian territory. Again, I make a distinction. Ukraine is perfectly, uh, has, has the right, it's perfectly legitimate to uh, carry the war into Russian territory as far as I'm concerned. But it's a, a separate question of whether the weapons which we supply to uh, Ukraine should be limited in their application, in their use, um, so that they are not used for a direct attack on, on Russia in order to avoid the impression that this is now a NATO war against Russia. That is I think, not in our interest. And I don't think this can be in the Ukrainian interest either. So this idea of uh, making sure that um, our Western weapons are not used to conduct a war against Russia in Russia is, a, um, uh, is, is an idea which is not new, which has been dominated our discussion for many months. Also, Die Welt reports that uh, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz is slowing down arms deliveries to Ukraine. Most of weapons which were promised for Ukraine in May ha has not been delivered to Ukraine yet. What is the reason of such policy of uh, Chancellor Scholz? Well, I don't think that that's correct. Um, I think the facts demonstrate that Germany has developed to be the, the, the most important supplier of arms, also of financial and other resources to Ukraine, um, uh, behind the United States, of course. So I think our track record was not a very impressive one, let's say, a year ago. But I think over the, the last nine or 10 or 12 months, uh, Germany has, as you know, supplied modern German-built tanks and um, um, uh, and 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 uh, anti-aircraft equipment like the Gepard um, and other anti-aircraft systems, which have demonstrated, which have been, which have been demonstrated to be extremely effective in the uh, Russian in the, in the conduct of the war against the Russian uh, aggression. So I think our track record is a good one. And we have uh, supplied more and more systems. And I have, I do not see, uh, I have no suspicion. I do not see, I do not share the view that um, the Schultz government 
is trying to slow down deliveries. On the contrary, I think there are now German companies that are actually examining um, the idea of building um, plants, factories, on Ukrainian territory to make sure that we could actually build certain weapon systems, ammunition systems, etc., in Ukraine rather than uh, somewhere in Western Europe with all the logistical issues that that entails. Let's cover also possible negotiations with Russia. Don't you think that any compromise with Russia could undermine efforts to hold Russia's war criminals accountable for their war crimes in Ukraine? Well, let me put it this way. Let's, 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 let's have our priorities right. I think the most important goal for Ukraine is to, 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 to have uh, to achieve an end to this war without the loss of territory. That is a very ambitious goal. It is not entirely clear to all of us whether that can be achieved, but that needs to be the number one goal. It is a very different goal um, and a secondary goal to think about such issues as reconstruction, who is going to finance rebuilding of the cities, towns, villages, which have been destroyed, especially in, in Donbass, uh, et cetera. Uh, and then the third question is, uh, of course, accountability. Uh, can, there be, uh, can there be a process, a, a judicial process, uh, that would take war criminals to task? A very important issue, yes, indeed, but it's not one that we should spend too much uh, about at this time, because at this po a point, we're still in a war. Uh, your country is still in a war with a, a huge neighbor, and the first priority needs to be to end this war uh, with a positive result for Ukraine. And then from then, uh, once that has been achieved, then we can uh, we can tackle the other the other issues. We must tackle the other issues of reconstruction, of accountability, of of criminal persecution, uh, of war crimes, etc. Remember, in World War II, uh, the the Nuremberg trial, which was conducted against German war criminals and German leaders, that well was only conducted, was only started a year after the, the war had ended. And I think it will probably be in the same sequence in, in this case. So let's have first priorities first. The first priority is uh, supporting Ukraine so that the war can be ended on a positive note for Ukraine without loss of territory. Uh, I'm afraid to say, um, of course, with a huge sacrifice of human lives, um, that, that, that Ukraine is paying such a terribly huge uh, price. I've been to Kiev uh, just a couple of weeks ago, so I know a little bit what I'm talking about, and this is why I am very much in favor of of of, of requesting of my own government and of other Western governments to to do even more so that Ukraine will be an even better position to, uh, to terminate this war uh, with a positive result for uh, the, the integrity, the territorial integrity uh, of Ukraine. Thank you very much. Also, advisor to the head of the office of president of Ukraine says that any territorial concessions to Russia could destroy international law and democracy uh, do you support such point? Well, you know, uh, the, if we must be clear. The, 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 the intention, the goal, the aim of Ukraine and of our support for Ukraine has to be the liberation of territories currently occupied. Now, if 
through the current military activities, that goal cannot be achieved in its totality, then, of course, the question might arise, what about, uh, uh, what about negotiating options? Um, and, and I am not going to start a discussion at this point uh, what kind of negotiating options Ukraine might wish to take a look at. But obviously, obviously, the question might arise, what if uh, not all of the uh, occupied territories can be completely liberated at this time? Uh, what might be negotiating options uh, for Ukraine at the negotiating table if and when such a negotiating table is being erected. So uh, I would not want to exclude any options, but at this point, clearly our aim should not be to start talking about giving up territory. Our goal should be to encourage Ukraine to try to liberate all of the occupied territories. And my last question for you will be regarding G20 summit in India. India has not invited Ukraine to join G20, but Russia has been invited. What is the reason of such decision and could Western governments do more to pressure India to invite Ukraine to join G20? Well, let me put it this way. I think the Ukrainian leadership, President Zelensky, his chief of staff, Yarmak, the Ukrainian government, has made a very impressive effort to start engaging with countries outside the classic uh, Euro-Atlantic sphere. I've, uh, I'm full of admiration for the Ukrainian effort to, um, um, to inspire the Saudi government to hold the recent conference in Jeddah uh, with participation, including even of China, which is, in my view, a major achievement Russia was not invited, China was invited, and China actually participated. So I think it's a very, very interesting approach uh, currently conducted by the Ukrainian leadership with the help of allies and partners, uh, including from outside our European or Euro-Atlantic sphere to, uh, to, to, to win support from countries in the global south. And I would hope that China and India and other major countries in the global south would uh, support Ukraine even more and would come uh, to join the effort to help Ukraine win this war against the aggressor from Russia. Thank you very much again. Thank you, Ambassador, for your time and for support for Ukraine and uh, glory to Ukraine. Слава Украине! Героям слава! Thank you very much. Thank you.